Thanks, uh, thanks the committee and, and Bob and Min. It's a great honor to be here. I really appreciate uh, uh, being invited to the talk. And uh, I've had a wonderful week here in Swansea, uh, attending all the different lectures, talking with old friends, m making many new friends. And I, I actually had a pretty good time in, in Wales before the conference even started. Uh, that's me on Monday afternoon at a Pennard Golf Club, which is a couple of miles from here. And if you remember the ruins on the homepage of the webpage, that's it right there. Um, so for the remainder of my talk, I only have about 187 more photos of me golfing to uh, <laughs> run through. And, uh, well, that's, uh, well if, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to show one more. So, uh, so this one, the next photo was my view when I stepped up to the first tee at Pennard and I kind of looked out in the fairway ready to hit my shot. <laughs> I, I can honestly say in the US I've never encountered that before uh, on, on the first tee. Thankfully, uh, I hit a pretty good shot. I get it airborne and there were no bovine casualties uh, <laughs> that day, but, uh, but it, was, it was fantastic. It, it was wonderful. I had a, I had a great day there. So um, I, I know that the audience here is a bit broader than just Eurovis. It's a general audience, and I, I talked to Bob and Min. And I've kind of cu customized my talk that way to be a little more general. Uh, I hope I've thrown some things in to keep the visualization researchers interested and engaged and focused. And, and we'll, we'll see how that, that goes as we go through. So I, I work in data visualization, and when I, uh, when I go out and I um, and with a group of people, maybe not academics, maybe I'm at a party or something like that, and they ask me what I do, I say, data viz. And they say, oh, you make pretty pictures. You do that kind of thing. And I said, no, 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 actually, I don't. That's really nice, and it's great stuff, but, but that's not what I do, per se. Uh, data visualization, visualization is really much more about understanding. It's a cognitive process, and I really love the word under, I think understanding is, is what it's all about. It's understanding data and, and all that's, that's involved in it. And that's, that's kind of really the, the, the key point and the key focus in it. And, and I, I'm gonna dwell on that word understanding as we go through. Uh, so how, you know, how, how do visuals do that? How do they help with understanding? How do they help us think? Well, largely they provide, they augment our memory system. In, in our cognitive systems, visuals kind of add on to the memory capabilities. And if anyone doubts that, ask them to multiply two three-digit numbers with and without a pad and a pencil. Okay, that, that, that working area there is, is augmenting memory. And in one way, it's, it's changing a process that's kind of cognitively demanding and tough into one that's much more about perception. And we're really good at perception yet. We're still beating the machines, although they're catching up. Uh, but perception is one thing we do really, really well. And finally, it engages our terrific pattern matching system. So visualization is taking advantage of all these things to, to assist in understanding. Now, the focus of my talk today is a lot about this value of visualization and, and what it's all about and, and how to help it. And, and one of my uh, points here, I think, is that as, as the viz researcher, it's what we do. So we all buy in, we, we know it, but to the broader community, I think there are still some questions and, and, and they don't know quite all about it. And I, I still encounter this a fair amount. And I think as a community, we need to do a better job of kind of trumpeting our message and getting it out there to, to, to the broader audience. Uh, I got involved in this topic uh, a few years back when I co-wrote a paper with Jean-Daniel Fiquet and Jacques Van Wyck and Chris North out of a dog stool workshop that came out. And we focused on this value. And I, I enjoyed this a lot, but I've always kind of felt that there were still unfinished business. And so that's what some of my work recently has been about. And that's certainly what this talk is, is very much about. Uh, and I think to, to help with value, right, value is a lot about understanding why and the purpose and the objective. Unless you have a fairly good handle on that, it's kind of hard to identify the value then. You, you really need to kind of work in and identify it. And, and to kind of show still some of these questions and so on, I have three different stories um, 
from things that happened, some fairly recently. So the first one, I was at a talk of a colleague uh, who did some visual analytics and data mining work. And there were some guests in the back, and they were from a local hospital. And they said, uh, we work in the cardiac care unit. And, you know, cardiac care, your heart, pretty, pretty important, pretty big thing. And they said, you know, for appointments, the regular doctor's appointment come in, we have a 10% no-show rate. One out of 10 people who have a cardiac appointment don't show up. That's probably not too good. You know, like, we want to improve on this. We, we want to, you know, we want to somehow figure out who they're going to be. Maybe we remind them in some way, something like that. And I was excited, but, it's, oh, you know, vis but that's largely a problem. I don't think you really need visualization at all. That's kind of the data mining 101 problem. You, you look back at the people who haven't showed up in the past, you identify their characteristics, use that as training, kind of match out. It's not a process that needs to be perfect. Maybe you send some emails. You don't want to spam everyone, but you can send some out and kind of hit the likely people. But it's not. It's not a visualization problem, really. And it was, it was bad, because these were wonderful. Oh, I wanted to collaborate with them. But uh, you know, square peg, round hole. It, it really kind of wasn't the right fit. Um, I'm a, a faculty member in the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech. And this spring, we interviewed some other visualization candidates. And we had a faculty meeting after looking at the candidates. And a couple of my colleagues you know, were discussing. And they're like, you know, we just don't get visualization. Some of these are some machine learning and data mining. You know, what, what, what is really a contribution? What are the open problems? What is it all about? What is it doing? And I, it was funny because I felt I had to stand up for these candidates and talk about what was going on. And you know, even though I've been there many, many years and these, these are my, my friends, and there was still that kind of question that was going on. Uh, and then in a final one, I had a master's student work with me do a project. Her name's Chloe G. And she chose Instagram and Instagram data to kind of look at. And you see her, her interface, her visualization interface, the system. You type a term in cat in the top left there. And it'll show you uh, Instagram with tag with cat over a period of time. The bars in the kind of middle are the number of likes and comments on images that have cat as part of it. The bottom left are the different types of filters applied in Instagram on that and how they, you can explore and the photos are coming up. She did a very nice job. She did a, an interesting presentation on it and there's some faculty judges and they're sitting around. She finished, hand goes up. Uh, this is all nice and good, but I want to know how to get more likes on my photos. How do I do that with this tool? And it's like, well, you can. You may help a little, but that's not the purpose. That's not what it's all about. And again, that's, that's a task that may be hinting toward other kinds of data analysis. So these are, are three different examples of things that, you know, viz isn't bad. It's just a kind of a mismatch, problems that, that didn't fit on it. Uh, so I think, you know, to summarize all that, you have to think about it. I have to go to that wonderful data visualization kind of philosopher and spokesman, Harry Callahan, uh, Clint Eastwood. And in a, in a movie called Magnum Force, he has a famous quote, a man's got to know his limitations. And, and I think that's kind of, in Viz, we, we need to understand what we're about and, and kind of where, you know, what are the good problems. So I've been talking a little bit about we're not. Let me focus, um, well, actually, b before finishing on that point, generalizing this, I believe a lot of times if, if you know precisely what you're looking for, if you have a question or two, visualization likely isn't the way to go. You've, you've got some other analytic approaches that can get you there probably faster, better. Overall, visualization is, is usually human in the loop. It's human-centered. And there's companies and other people, right, humans, what are they? They're expensive, they get sick, they take time. Right, if you can press a button and get something, well, why not go that way? Okay, so, but, but okay, kind of, so what are we good for? Where does it all come in? So let me kind of turn the page and, and move on to that. In our community, the general kind of high level two kind of purposes or application of visualization are presentation, communication, and analysis. And, and a real nice way to think about them, explanatory and exploratory. Okay, th those two terms. And I, I think it really hits on it. And I want to spend a little time looking at each of these. I, um, 
The analysis side has been kind of the bread and butter for our research community for a long time. Over the last five years, the presentation side has become a growing topic and very exciting. And uh, I am more and more convinced, as I'll talk in a bit, that they're quite different. They're apples and oranges. Okay, they're both fruit. They're both fruit, so they draw a lot of the same ideas. But they're a bit different. And let me, let me expand upon that a little bit further. So presentation's a lot about explaining, informing, evidence support, and perhaps even influencing and persuading. And I think the most common place you're going to see kind of visualization, maybe modest, for presentation purposes nowadays is infographics on the web. They've exploded. Just Google, you know, infographics of the year or whatever. There's tons of them out there. Uh, so I have to show a few. Uh, so things like this, right? Visually, the website has some nice ones. This is the nuclear arms race, NATO, uh, so Russia, et cetera. Um, this is a famous one. I don't know if you've seen it in the US, death and taxes. It's very hard to see projected. But it's a node link graph. And it shows the US budget and the different pieces component and kind of the size of something is how much money going toward it. And it's, you know, to see it up on a wall in a poster, it, it, you can really see everything. It's just beautiful, it's very interesting. Uh, being here in the UK, I had to show beer. Uh, uh, this is the periodic table. Uh, <laughs> and I know that at the banquet last night, some people sampled some of the elements here in the table. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a very interesting, wonderful graphic that uses color, it uses layout, typography to kind of tell a story and, and be what it's all about. Um, there's a baseball in one uh, from the New York Times. New York Times does wonderful work uh, that uses line graphs and histograms and lots of text that shows uh, the home run kings in, in American baseball. Uh, this is interesting. In, in, in kind of infographics on the web, you don't see 3D that much. It's usually 2D. Here's one that I, I picked up and I like. You asked, the, it's using the, the height to indicate population, but it's not population, actually, because if you look at Atlanta, where I live, in kind of the bottom right, there's not a very big hump there. This, uh, the height is population density, okay? So it's kind of per unit area. And you see the Northeast being quite dense. And, you know, one of the gestalt takeaways from this graphic is there isn't a whole heck of a lot out west uh, in the U.S. It's kind of this vast open prairie uh, for, the, for the most part. But an interesting one. Uh, gosh, World Cup just started, so I have to show football. Uh, so this is from the European Championship a couple of years ago, summarizing some of the main teams and where goals were scored and who was their leading scorer and so on. Um, I woke up this morning, was looking on Facebook a little bit, and I saw uh, Bloomberg's, this is the current World Cup. Last night's result was in there. They're doing kind of a little tree and the different groups and they have predictions. And how is it all going forward? They've got Germany. Um, <laughs> uh, yesterday morning at the hotel, I opened up my Times newspaper and I read the World Cup section. And they had two interesting graphs. They had, uh, I assume, readers in the UK pick different teams and how they were going to emerge. And they used this kind of circle graph. And it's interesting. I hadn't seen this before. And I think it is the percent of the way out is the percent. So each, each group is 200% because two teams emerge from each group. Uh, I can zoom in a little. So yes, the England fans still think they're going to uh, win and come out. <laughs> But it's an interesting graph because England is 76% of the way out, Italy 71. So it's covering it a lot, which to me is not such a great visualization because then it's very thin in England. It just, something isn't quite working on it very well. But it was an interesting graphic uh, yesterday. And of course, the US group, we're that little dot in the center. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we'll see, we'll see, maybe, maybe. Uh, we played Monday afternoon. Uh, so. Okay, so in, in presentation and kind of infographics, what you're really trying to do in many cases is clarify, focus, you know, highlight, simplify, perhaps, and persuade. And what I argue is that a lot of times you may just show a few variables of the different attributes or variables. You may only show portions of your data set, okay? because there's a story going on and there's a message to be communicated. And I frequently notice this kind of thing being done. 
bookmark that thought as we kind of move ahead a little bit. Uh, the final kind of points on presentation I want to make is that, you know, there's data all kinds. Simply presenting data visually can have a very, very profound impact. I had this hit home uh, on a personal level one. So uh, I'm a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. That is a public university. It's not a private university. We're public. As such, I am a state employee. As such, you can find out my salary, okay, just as you can for every other state employee. Actually, it's not my salary. It's compensation. It's a pretty ugly, w which has salary plus like if you travel or a little bit. So it's very close. Uh, it's a, it, there's a website for this. It's ugly. It's queries. It's hard to, you get to see kind of one thing at a time. It's a mess. But I know some of my colleagues routinely look at that website. And, you know, browser, I've looked at it from time to time, you know, myself a few times. Uh, so what does this, you know, what does this kind of have to do? Well, I teach in the fall a graduate information visualization course. Fifty percent of the students' grade is a design project over the semester, a group project, three or four people. Two falls ago, a group came to me and said, John, could we, you know, there's that salary data and compensation. Could we build a visualization of that? What do you think about that? I said, that's interesting. I know, you know, certainly it would appeal to a lot of people. It's data, you know, one of my charts of the group is always find interesting data, right? That's the most important thing. And this would be, so I said, go for it. So they worked all semester um, and did a very nice job. They built a system here. I love the name in the upper left, Salaried. Um, and it was a two view system. In the upper left, there's kind of a map, and you can pick different departments, and I've kind of grayed out, but there's like a scrolling list of, of faculty by salary. Uh, you get it by assistant, associate, full professor. These are some tree maps, again, looking at it. Here's some interesting gender with pink versus blue, and so on. It, they used Google Chart. They did some, it was a very nice A, great project. Proud of it. It's end of our fall term, right before Christmas. I got a, you know, really nice. So I sent an email out to my faculty list, very proud of this, you know, faculty salary. <laughs> About an hour later, the first email I got was from my former chair who said, what's the over under bet on how long this website is up? Uh, their, their thing. Oh. I then got an email from a colleague who was not so happy with me. Uh, and he said, what are you trying to prove? <laughs> Uh, what, you know, what is this, you know, right before Christmas? Are you trying to, what, 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 what's kind of going on here with it? Are you, you know, what's, um, shortly thereafter, I got an email from, because the faculty list is monitored by our chair, I got an email from our PR person in my department saying, John, this is an interesting website. Um, we're going to have to tell the Georgia Tech PR people about its visibility and presence out there. And actually, my former chair then came to my office and we were chatting a bit. And he's like, you know, what's, what's going on? Well, I'm very proud of this. I think it's interesting. I thought a bit about it. Later that night, I asked the students to take the site down. Uh, so, <laughs> so it was kind of interesting. Excuse me. Uh, it was kind of interesting. Um, I, didn't, I, I didn't respond to my colleague who kind of sent the scathing email to me. I never did. But I sent a note out to the faculty later that night, a very short one. I've asked the students to take this site down. Okay. The next morning, I had about five emails from faculty saying, why? It was great. What'd you do? And I'm like, none of, none of you came to my defense yesterday. Uh, uh, so, but it, it was interesting. That data is all public. This viz showed nothing that, that someone couldn't find the other way. But by representing it in this visual manner, and it was just so easy to compare and so on, it had a very profound impact. Uh, you know, it kind of really hit home. And it's really too bad. I think maybe what we could have done is instead of put the names there, have like, you know, faculty one or something. Because even with that, there's some really interesting things about gender imbalance and salary. And, you know, it tells a very interesting story. And it, it was really too bad in a way. But it, this very much hit home to me. And there's the students who did a great job with it. And of course, you know, there was a broader example of this in the US about two years ago. Um, a newspaper in New York City 
took, they have public gun ownership data. You can go to a website and find out the re each residence on a street and do they own a gun or how many because it has to be registered. So they did a Google Maps mashup where you could just go drill into your Google map, walk to a street and see who, oh, <laughs> wow, a lot hit fan. The, the uh, writers and the publisher and editor at that newspaper were publicly attacked. The names of their children, the schools they went to were published on websites. Uh, it was a very big case for a long time. And again, it was all data that was totally accessible any other way. But just by putting it in this Google Maps mashup, wow. Uh, I, this, to me, this is a fascinating ethical issue. It's very interesting. A, a couple of my colleagues after this happened, say, they teach our computer ethics, CS4000. They're like, John, this is great. You just gave me a week in the class to <laughs> discuss this whole case and what it's all about. And um, yeah, so it's really interesting stuff. Um, and of course, you know some of the best examples of visualization for presentation purposes. Hans Rosling and Gapminder have made this. This TED Talk is fantastic. been viewed millions of times. It's just really good. If you've never seen it, please watch it. And perhaps the most famous example, I think, is Al Gore's uh, Inconvenient Truth movie that talks about global warming. And he uses relatively simple information graphics. To, uh, to make a point about global warming and what's happening. And in, in the one scene, it's very hard to see on the right, he's got a bar, uh, line graph that's going up, and he has to get on a ladder to go get you know, the value up high. And, and it's visualization for presentation and persuasion purposes. All right, second half, analysis. Okay, analysis is now about exploring data, assessing a situation. How, how do I proceed? Deciding what to do. And as I said, it's been the bread and butter of our community for a long time. But there are a variety of other data analysis approaches, right? There's queries and search on the web, and there's data mining, machine learning, statistics, all kinds of things. So visualization is one tool in the tool bag of, of different techniques. Uh, but I love this. William Cleveland, if you know, very famous statistician, wonderful. Contained within data of any investigation is information that can yield conclusions to questions not originally asked. That is, there can be surprises. To miss them by failing to probe thoroughly with biz tools is inefficient because the cost of intensive data analysis is typically small compared with the cost of collection, which can be a real pain sometimes. So, uh, I would argue that on analysis, as opposed to what we talked about on presentation before, I want to see all the variables, or many of them, right? I, I, I want to see the big picture, and I want to be able to see details. I want to get at comparison. So in the presentation part before, where it's like, ah, I may choose certain things to look at, here in, in analysis, it's like, I don't want to miss anything. Okay, so don't, don't hide anything. And I'd argue that for analysis, sometimes you build systems that are not just easy. You walk up and you look at it, and boy, it's great. I could just you know, learn it and go. They're complex. But with that power, but with that complexity can be a lot of visual power, which is good. All right. So viz, I think, uh, on the analysis side is really most useful in what we call EDA, exploratory data analysis. It goes about what I talked before with these you know, concrete, you know exactly what you want. This is the other side of it, right? Here's this pile of data. I think there's something interesting in there. I, I don't know what. I don't know how to look. It's hard to write a mining query to get a, you know, what do I do there? Or when you don't have questions ahead of time. Or when you simply want to know what questions to ask. Visualization is very powerful and very good in those situations. And what I'd argue why this works is because at its heart is uncertainty. And as human beings, we live in uncertainty all the time. And one of my favorite, we, you know, we trade off. We, we compromise. Nothing's perfect, and, and we're always looking at things. One of my favorite examples of this is, a, is an old uh, project in the InfoViz community, but from here in the UK. Bob Spence and Lisa Tweedies, uh, their attribute explorer. And they have an example where you're buying a house, right? And you're always, well, I'll take three bedrooms instead of four because it's in such a nice area and it's less, right? Life is all about making these trade-off compare. And, and I think visualization aligns to that extremely well. Um, and that's one of my old favorite projects uh, in our community. 
And now, one of the ideas of talking about analysis here, I think on the analysis side, we underestimate the first part, the communication, the storytelling side. You still want to do that well, and, and I think our analysis systems do need to learn some from some of these very nice presentational infographic storytelling, et cetera, that there's a lot to be gained there. All right, back to my, my main point, this, this value thing and what it's all about. And I've been thinking about it, and you know, I'm, I'm a scientist, uh, apparently, you know, one thing or another. I gotta throw an equation at you. I gotta, you know, I gotta, gotta bring a little bit in. So here it is, okay. So I've been thinking a lot about visualization's value. So that's V, and it's equal to T plus I plus E plus C. All right, let's get into it a little bit. I promise no Greek letters, though. Uh, so what's the T? The T is, a visualization's ability to minimize the total time needed to answer a wide variety of questions about the data. Okay, maybe not everything, but it, you could just kind of look at it and quickly and do it and kind of get it done and move on. Okay? And you're doing it without knowing SQL, right? Or you're doing it without some kind of formal query language. And here, interaction really helps, and that's a point I'm going to come back to. Okay, what kinds of questions might you ask? Well, I've done a little bit of work in the past with some students on the kind of low-level tasks that typically occur. You look, at, you look at a visualization and you're retrieving values or you're finding them in or how are these things sorted? What's the distribution? Things like that. Those are the kind of things you're doing all the time. And you want to be able to do them very, very quickly and easily. So that's part one. Part two, the I. It's all about insight. Okay, the ability to spur and discover insights or generate insightful questions about the data. Okay, to, to kind of get in. This is moving past the first just do those base things, right? And I argue Viz can let you sometimes do things that are very, very difficult to do if you just had the data, if you didn't have the visuals. And hopefully I'll make that point kind of coming up in a bit. Um, now, inside, I brought up this word. In, in, in my community, it's, it's a very interesting word, and it's been studied a lot. What is it all about? Chris North's research group at Virginia Tech has looked at it, and they define it as an individual observation about the data by the participant, a kind of unit of discovery. And they say there's these five characteristics. And the last one I've highlighted, because I think it's kind of interesting, unexpected. And insight is unexpected. And I'm actually not sure I agree with that, that it needs to be unexpected. Um, but they've developed an evaluation methodology based on this that is really quite nice. So I looked a little bit broader. I looked to the psychology community. So a very well-known psychology textbook defines insight as a sudden grasp of new relationships that are necessary to solve a problem that were not learned in the past. I like that. That's kind of getting at it further. But I think in the visualization community, when we use the word insight, we mean a slightly different thing. And there was a very nice CGNA viewpoint, I think it was a viewpoints article a few years back, by Remco Chang and colleagues from UNC Charlotte that I really like. They say that when Viz people use the word insight, they don't mean that spontaneous aha, right? You're in the shower and the light bulb goes on. It's like, I got it now. Which in cognitive science, many times, that's what insight's all about. That's not what we mean. We mean much more things like, knowledge building and model confirmation, right? It's like, I understand. I'm kind of wrapping my head around all this and it's kind of fitting in. It's like this substance that, that I acquire, the aid with systems. So this is a, a, a nice little article and I really like that notion of insight that, that they've, they've uh, talked about. All right, back, what's the E? The E is the, the ability can, to convey this overall essence or takeaway kind of sense of the data, the big picture, right? Uh, the whole we want to be greater than the sum of the parts. Okay, we want something else to emerge, the E. Okay, great old fan. In the InfoViz community, we talk about overview and detail and focus and context. A wonderful old system called the table lens that applies graphics to, you know, Excel kind of spreadsheets. And, you know, really good, you can zoom in on particular data points, but you see the big picture yet. Uh, really nice example. And this certainly goes into things like fisheye views from George Furness and so on. Okay, the last one, the C. This has this unique side ability, I think, to generate confidence about your data, the domain and context. This is a great way to find errors in data and problems in it. And it's this kind of side benefit. So that's, that's the fourth part of, of what it's all about. 
All right, so now I've you know, put this out, yeah, yeah, that's a bunch of symbols and whatever. Let me try to show it through some examples and, and what it's all about and how does it work. Okay, the first one I took from an Edward Tufte book. Uh, it's a New York Times weather graphic. It shows a year's worth of weather data in New York, New York City. Um, there's 2,220 numbers in this. If you wonder about them, you get highs and lows and averages and all kind of things kind of going on. Kind of see it there. Just a wonderful kind of graphic design that was there. Um, you know, well, what is it all about, the time? Well, I'm, I'm able to answer questions like, you know, what was the high and the low the most for the year? And what was the rain in this period? Well, right, I can answer all kind of things just by glancing at it. Okay, I don't have to write a query. I don't have to do anything. Now, some stuff I can't do. I can't tell you what was the low temperature on August 28th. Okay, but that's okay. I can get in the ballpark of it uh, and things like that. So, but it's about, this is really easy, the time. I, the insights, we start to look at it and we get things like, well, you know, the spring was quite rainy with those big, big blue bars. And the humidity maybe is a little less in, you know, with January, February, but it's kind of variable through the year. Um, December was quite, right? There, there's some things that I just kind of look at that I probably really have to stare at a spreadsheet to take away. And I can take away very easily here. You know, the essence, I get the feel for the year and how when the, you know, the lowest temperatures are and how it goes, I get that kind of big picture from it. And see the confidence, well, I didn't generate this, so I don't know. But, but you know, I don't know what the process was like for, for putting that data forward. Um, interesting, my hometown newspaper has adopted that. So just earlier this year, that was last year's Atlanta weather. And they did some, some interesting variations. You see our drought that we had the previous year. And last year, we had a lot of rain. So again, big picture. Look at our summer. And the real high and low compared to the average, it was very kind of non-variable. And it was quite cool last summer. We had a lot of rain that kind of came about. And again, just a very, very nice graphic kind of telling an interesting story. Um, a second example I want to show. My students all know this is one of my favorite info visas that's out there. Uh, the map of the market that shows the stock market the various sectors and companies. The, each block is a company. Its size is its market cap. The color is its performance. I actually don't like the new one so much, the new map of the market. I like the old one. I'm old school. Um, <laughs> Martin Wattenberg, a fantastic visualization researcher, built this when he was at IBM many years ago. He uses a slightly different color scheme. You can get into it and so on. Um, so let's look at it. T, all the questions. Well, I can, now this has tooltip pop up, so I can get the details. I can mouse over a company. I can see sectors, how it was, high and low. I can answer a lot of questions with this. Okay, insights. What kind of insights are going on? Well, I see, you know, capital goods was doing quite well, and, and, and it's up. I look at specific features, I could, you know, I get, get kind of things. Big picture, the E. Well, that, you know, I kind of see this day, this was a day it was looked at, pretty green. It was pretty good overall. Sometimes things are different, though. Um, this is a day my students have all learned. I love this. So every time a weird stock day happens, I get emails of the map of the market uh, with the images. So that was, the Dow was up 282 points one day, right? You want to get an essence, a big picture? Bright green, good. You know, hope you had the stocks. Unfortunately, some days are the opposite. Uh, the, the US market was down 777 points this day uh, one time. But right, it's all about insight and unexpected things. There's a green block. Anybody know what the green block probably is? What kind of company, what kind of stock? If the market's down that horrible? Gold, right, gold stock. All right, uh, but it raises interesting questions and how does it all work and so on. So one of my favorites. And confidence, again, I didn't build this. I don't know the, the project, the data. How does it all work? Um, all right. Uh, the next one is a system of my own. And I hope to now, we'll see, do a, uh, a little demo. But this is uh, a bunch of years of the InfoViz conference and the citations. Each year are in the blocks that you see, the rows that you see there. And each little circle is a paper. In the, in the conference. And we're trying to show citations. When I mouse over uh, a block, in yellow it's selected in the focus. The papers that it cites in earlier years are in green. The papers citing it from later years 
are in blue. The darkness of a circle overall is the total number of Google Scholar citations that that paper uh, has had over the years. And as you mouse over, you see the data on the bottom. So this dark one right here is the Visitor paper that had, when we did this earlier this year, 482 Google Scholar citations and 17 subsequent InfoViz conference citations. And I can move around, I can do things like just show me, darken it now to be only the internal, so only the conference papers within InfoViz. And you see it roughly correlates. I can go back to external. The little yellow dots are the best paper award winners. You see they always aren't the highest cited papers. Um, interesting how it goes. There are some that are, right? Hierarchical edge bundles, rolling the dice, or some best paper award winners. And you can do interesting different things, like uh, Sheila was here earlier. So I look for Carpendale, and I can see all of Sheila's papers, OK, and where they are and how do they all fall. Um, if I want to see some interesting kind of topics, we've defined a lot of terms. And oops, let me find one that I think is kind of cool. Um, go down to uh, user study. Those are papers mentioning user study in the title or the abstract. You can see how it's a topic that just came up a little bit more recently. Um, I can drill in. There's some interesting things. If you look at 2000, um, there's like a big four papers. It's kind of Edgy's Taxonomy, Polaris, uh, my own paper about Sunburst, and uh, Theme River that are all in there. One of the other things I notice, and I know this is projected so it's hard, I consider kind of the golden year 2004. If you look, it's kind of dark all the way across in Austin, Texas. It was great. I happen to have the best paper award winner that year. Uh, <laughs> as you see, it wasn't, it's not the most cited paper, um, something like that. There's other interesting things that come out. I had a paper in the very first year at InfoViz, and it's done quite well. It adds 222 Google Scholar citations, and only three subsequent InfoViz papers cited it. So <laughs> it's had a pretty broad impact in the community, but not so much in InfoViz, the conference itself. So these are the kind of things that you can kind of just you know, dive in and explore and, and kind of look at the system to, to get at. All right, let me uh, push on ahead ahead a little bit, so I need to go back to this. Okay, so T, all kind of questions I could answer about the data and the numbers and this and that. Insights, we got some things like, you know, the years and how they were better. Insight-wise, there's a paper in the very first year of InfoViz that has received zero citations <laughs> subsequently. You know, I, I still stumble about There's just, you know, interesting kind of things that come up. The essence, you get the big picture. It's grown, we've had more papers. How do the citation patterns go? How does it go overall? The C I can now talk about. We found loads of problems in the IEEE digital library. There's missing papers, there's weird things going on. And then when we, my students and I went through the papers by hand and logged all this, uh, we made mistakes. We, we ran the tool and it's like, how can a paper cite one in the future? That doesn't make it. And the viz, it just jumped out, you know, as you kind of saw it. So it all kind of fits there and together. Um, so let me, let me talk a little bit more here about value as we get into it. To me, value is not a valuation in a kind of traditional sense. Um, in the HCI community, evaluation is, has been very well studied and it's known. And we use typically benchmark tasks to evaluate a system. Someone works and they, they kind of you know, work on a tool, they do these benchmark tasks. But in visualization, I talked about earlier, I think it's best for things where the task is fuzzy. Right? You don't know it very well. It's not quite clear what you're doing. It's about exploration and understanding. So can you apply those traditional evaluation measures? I'm not so sure. And to be honest, I resonate strongly with a friend of mine who gave the capstone at the Viz conference last year, um, Jacques Van Wyck, who said, he said a lot about evaluation and he said, let's close the doors and say, on evaluation. <laughs> Build cool stuff and build it. And I very much resonate with that. I am, to some degree, somewhat frustrated when I read a pair and it's, oh, you should have had a user study here. 
I disagree nine times out of 10 with that. I think, as Yach said, it's someone who was too nice on a review and they didn't want to say other reasons why they didn't like it. It was confusing, it was hard to understand. But just go ahead and say that. Having 12 grad students pick on the thing for a few minutes is not going to convince me as a reviewer that it's good or bad or, or anything like that. I would rather see the, the time spent in the paper giving a case study or an example of use and doing. As a reviewer, it's my job to evaluate it and to figure out what it's all about. And that's a paid political announcement. Um, so, but uh, I agree with Yach about some of those things. Uh, to, to hit on the benchmark task, so a wonderful star report paper that was done earlier here in the week, uh, set, set visualization. And they enumerated like 35 different tasks you can perform on sets. And, but think about what Viz is all about, right? I could build a system, a query interface, that could do all 35 of those tasks great. But it wouldn't be, you know, it's not a viz. A viz, right, should do more than that, right? The, the whole should be greater than the sum of the parts. So just running a user study where you have these individual tasks and you get at it, a lot of times it's like, I wouldn't use the viz to do each of those individual, it's, it's a bigger picture kind of thing. Um, so, you know, go on. All right, so I'm talking about this. Um, to kind of go a little further along, I'm going to take you back to class a little bit here, kind of data viz 101. And it's, you know, this isn't rocket science, people. You've got a problem, you've got a lot of data, you need to understand it. Basically, you know, you've got to quite do you. You've got three ways to go. One, you, you take all your data, you've got some kind of viz, and you pack it all in. Right, you show all different variables, something, you, gen you know, there it is. Here's a very creative viz, option one. Option two, you use multiple coordinated views. You kind of spread that data across the views. They're coordinated. You can click, brush, and link, things like that. You use that win. The third alternative is you use interaction. Right? I can't show all the variables. I can't show all the data. So the user has to click on it and move and pan and zoom and, and drill into various things. But that's in my students in my class. When they design, I say, you got three choices for the most part. You, you, you know, you got to work on this. And that last one is what I'm going to kind of finish off my talk today, spending a little bit of time on interaction and what it's all about. I think it's kind of understudied and very important in the Viz community. And you'll often hear the two key components of visualization are representation and interaction. Here's a quote by Stephen Few that talks and, and, and hits on that very point. Uh, I think it's very much what it's all about. And interaction, when it's really good in a visualization, it almost makes you feel like you can have a conversation with your data. You engage in a dialogue. Oh, that's interesting. Well, now what about this? How do I do that? And how do I work? Okay, and, and what is it all about? But I've, I've really had an issue over the years in thinking about interaction. I think there's two ways to go with it. One way of viewing it is kind of as a, an equal sibling. You know, at the main table with representation, two sides, one and two. It's one. The alternative way to think about it is it's really a subordinate. It's viz, it's what you see. And interaction is simply the way you get to the next frame, right? It's how do I get over there? So it's this kind of subservient, you know, step. And I'm not sure. I think I, I lean a little more toward the first one, but it's, an, it's kind of an interesting philosophical question to, to think about a bit. Now, we can look at it in various ways, interaction. Why would you want to interact with a viz? Well, I did a paper uh, a few years ago with some students where we studied, I think, ultimately to get at interaction. Why? What are you doing? What's your intent? And we looked at a lot of different systems and said, it's not, there's not that much you want to do. You want to select something. You want to explore further. You want to drill down. You want to reconfigure. You know, it's these kind of basic things. And there's a lot of different ways to do each of them. But that's the intent. So that's one angle. Another way to think about this, this kind of interaction stuff um, is kind of how, how is it, how is it though manifest? Those are the intents, but what is done with interaction? My PhD student, Chad Stolper, did a project over the spring, and you know, he just looked at it, hundreds of visualization, graphics on the web systems, and we said, what interaction do they provide? Do they have a lot of interesting different things? And he's got this chart, and we looked at it, and for the most part, this is what you get. You get tooltips and selection, 
because you get some details of the items. You can navigate, you can pan and zoom around, and you get brushing and linking. Now that's not everything, but it turns out it covers a lot. And I think that's kind of sad, because I think we can do more than that. I think we can do a lot better. And there are some systems, I think, that, that do a little bit more than that. Um, so, so how do we get at more? Well, let's think about interaction not in just this you know, simple getting here to there and stuff, but being a more fundamental at the table with representation. Okay, how do we get at it? Well, I showed you SiteViz before. One alternative that we could have done on SiteViz, right, that's a big network. We could draw the line from every paper to the ones that cite it, right, and we get the ball of string very quickly. We made a design choice on SiteViz not to do that. You have to interact. You move over and you see it. Now, that's a plus and a minus. It's a minus in a way in that you have to interact, and you kind of see one focus at a time. And you can actually click on one and kind of bookmark it and then move around and so on. But we made a design choice there, and we're using interaction to selectively show some of the data because we felt that showing all of it would be overwhelming and would be counterproductive. So that's one way. I worked with uh, some other students earlier to build a system called Dust and Magnet. It's kind of an interesting one. This is a viz of serials. They're the little dots. That's our data points. The variables are attributes of the serial. You see sodium and sugar. They're like magnets, and the data is like these iron dots. And you grab one of those magnets and you move it around. If you grab the sugar magnet, the cereals high in sugar kind of move faster to it. So this is a visualization. If you don't interact, it doesn't work. It's a fundamental part of what the visualization is all about. It's not the greatest visualization in the world. It has some issues and it's kind of clunky, but it, it, it's different in, in a way. Um, the, the one uh, that I want to try to, if I can do the computer again, uh, show you a little demo of a new system that I've been working on with some students. Uh, it's called Onset, and it uses interaction. Here it is. So everybody stop doing email and Facebook because I need all the bandwidth on the web browser here <laughs> that I can get. Uh, so this is uh, it's a set visualization, and this particular problem I work with a researcher at the Georgia Aquarium, and they got blood samples from whale sharks that are in the aquarium. You know whale sharks. Uh, and they've taken blood samples at various periods of time. They did, a, they did an analysis, and they get kind of micro compounds that are in the blood, over 1,000 of them. They have about data from 10 sharks, an average of about five samples, kind of about 50 points of data. Each sample, you think of potentially having all, there were like a thousand compounds, they're either there or not, it's a set problem. Each blood sample's a set, each compound is an element. How do we look at it? Well, here is uh, our onset system. So I can go in and get these samples. So, so Norton is the name of a shark. So let me add it, and let me go down a little bit. Ralph is another shark. Any of you Honeymooners fans might know uh, some of these names. Uh, let me add kind of Taroko. So what we do in this viz, some of you know like Euler diagrams, Venn diagrams, we take a different approach. Each block is a set. And each element, each compound is in a unique position, but it's potentially drawn in every set. So this is telling me this is N something, acetylglutamine, and it's an amino acid, which is that first kind of block of items. If it's black, that element is not in that sample. It's not in the set. When something's not in another one, it kind of fades out, and we kind of move around, and I can look at the other things that are in it. And now, of course, in sets, you want to do what's common, what's different. Boy, what would, what would be a good way to do that? You know, how would I kind of interact with this? I just drag it on top, OK? And now we're doing an and. So it's kind of like a bitwise and, in a way. And I see, here are the compounds that are shared amongst those two samples. If I want to see kind of more of an intersection, I change it to an or, and now I get more of a heat map kind of view that I can look at. We can go back to and, and I can drag other ones in to kind of explore and build these up. I can kind of take them on out and do things like that. If I change to the compounds, I can now, as I examine the compounds and go in them, I can see if they're in there or not. Um, we've done some things so, uh, <laughs> You want to see how the sets are similar? We use these bands, and the width of the bands 
is how similar, the, by the thickness of the band as you kind of drive in and, and get it. So that's, that's kind of, it's set visualization. But the idea here is very different. Why do you have to represent an element only once? We replicate it and we use it a lot. And we use interaction just kind of fundamentally here in the tool. All right, let me go back and kind of finish up here. Um, is that it? Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, to kind of wrap one up, so interaction, a final bit. Now the final piece of it I think is what do you interact with? Well, visualization, till fairly recently, has almost always been desktop, and we use keyboard and mouse. Visualization has a lot of controls, a lot of little items you drill in. But nowadays, people use tablets quite a bit. I fought my students for a long time. Like, why would you want to do viz on a tablet? Right, it's tiny, you don't have the resolution. It's like cooking a gourmet dinner for 10 on a hot plate. I mean, it just, just didn't make sense. But they kept pushing at me, they kept pushing at me, and I was like, okay, and now we've got higher res, we've got things to work with. So it's an interesting notion. I have a business colleague, and he's like, John, all the people I know, they don't want a laptop, they just all carry tablets. So, you know, can you, can you do Viz there? Well, there's some really nice projects that are getting going in this space. Bong Shin Lee and colleagues at MSR did a, did a system called uh, TouchWave, where they, they do touch on a tablet to, to these kind of stack graphs. Um, right here at Euroviz, Petra gave a presentation looking at how would you do selection on a tablet of various kind of visualizations. Really nice things. Well, two weeks ago today, my student, Ramik Sadana, presented a paper at the AVI conference. Como is really nice. I had to show <laughs> off a picture um, two weeks and, and presented a paper. And we've done a bit of work on moving kind of viz to tablets. And we focused first on a scatter plot. Um, let me, I have a short little two minute video I want to show you of this system. Uh, let me see if I can get there. There it is. And let me run it. That's a query preview. Now. different gestures that you could do to make things work. Zooming, we found like eight different ways you might want to zoom. All right, so to wrap up, I want to finish off to thinking a little bit about it, to talk about kind of big picture, longer term, key open problems, and what it's about in Viz. And I, I've been thinking a lot about three that, that I think hit on it. First one, I've been talking about today, right? This notion of assessing and communicating value. We need to do a better job of it, uh, getting all around. And maybe, maybe in a little way, this equation kind of starts some, some thought about it and, and going forward. So that, that's one. I think a second one is really this, this idea of we need to make it easier to build visualizations. 
Um, it's still challenging. It's still hard. Let's open it up. And there's, again, some really nice work recently. Uh, again, Bangshin's sketch story system from Viz last year. And just here, uh, Arvin's uh, Lyra system that he presented, I think it was yesterday morning. Really nice, wonderful work. Um, so that's a, another area we need to be moving forward. And a final one, we need to think bigger. Okay, we need, we need to kind of get out there and make an impact. And it's a bit tough on visualization sometimes, because in many ways, we're kind of an assistive, you know, we're a helper technology in, in a way. But I mean, thinking about things like, right, weather and floods and warming and health and emergency response, things like that, I, I think we ought to try to move into those areas and help these domains. Um, so all right, you've got to wrap up. You've got to have something to take home on your trips back home. So a few takeaway points, just summarizing what I did. Point number one, if you just have one specific thing to do, you don't need Viz in all likelihood. But if it's open-ended, if it's ambiguous, if there's uncertainty, if there's some compromise, if you're exploring, Viz is what it's all about. And it's something to, to look at that's quite good. Presentation analysis, they're different. Think about them carefully. They're related. But they're different. Think about what you do and learn from each. Um, value, right, T-I-E-C. That's what it's all about. And then the last one, interaction provides a lot of power. Let's use it more. Let's take advantage of it. OK, and finally, you know, if you struggle, you've got a bunch of data. You need to do a solution. You need to solve it and work on it. I'm old school. I've been around a long time. You've got to go back to the classics, I think. So when you have a really tough problem, resort to the bar chart. Uh, you know, the bar chart's where it's all about. So uh, thank you. Okay, um, we're a little bit behind schedule, so we're going to take one or two questions and then move on over to Cafe West and continue partying there. Um, do we have maybe one or two questions? Um, Jesse. And Jesse, could you speak into the microphone? Thank so, Jesse you. Kennedy. Um, I was interested in the, the value that you were talking about, John, and I was thinking about the different um, variables you, that you had there. And the, the T, the I, and the E all seem to me to be um, value to the user of the visualization. But every time you talked about C, you said you couldn't because you didn't build it. So the C was some sort of value that, that required the person that was building the visualization, which I thought was a bit of a shame because as a user of the visualization, I would really like to be confident in it. So I was just wondering if you wanted to make some comment on how we could get the C much more of value to the user as well. Yeah, I, and I think you're absolutely right on that. And I perhaps, I perhaps undersold it. Uh, I, uh, I have an example of that where um, I. I have a system some of you know about Jigsaw, and we've, we've done some work on wine review data. And we had to clean it a bit and work on it. Um, and then we've kind of showed it to people. And, and just in working in it, you, you don't necessarily learn about just that data, but, but in certain ways, you start to learn about wines, right? And the context and, and all of what it's about in the domain and, and how you kind of explore it. So my, when I did characterize it, I think the main part of the C was for kind of the people doing the data analysis or getting into it. But I do think there are some, some benefits to the end user that are somewhat peripheral, uh, kind of outside the data in that sense. But they're, they're more central about the domain and what it's all about. So I, I, I agree 100%. Shall we have one more question from the Helwig. distinguished Helwig Hauser? John, thank you for your talk. Uh, first of all, I, I, I agree with you that interaction is incredibly powerful and, and visualization without interaction is only half, half the story. Uh, I also agree with this T in your, in your value formula. Uh, very often 
it seems that this is the easiest way to sell visualization if you can make something faster, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder, I mean, interaction is really powerful, but it comes at the cost of time, of user time. How, mm -hmm. how do you see these two things go together? Uh, and, and it was, it's kind of like what I talked about with the site viz system there, right? I have to move over it, I have to query around. It's not just all laid out in front of me. But also, if, if I didn't have the viz and I had to issue queries or I had to get into a database, right? That's going to take time too. So I'm hoping, yeah, interaction's going to take some time, but hopefully it's less than all of that. Um, I think Ben Schneiderman makes some really good arguments about visualization being this kind of visual easy SQL, right? I can, I can do all those SQL queries, but rather than having to remember the syntax of it all, I just click and I move around. Now, sometimes there are complex interfaces where it's not as easy as just click, but, uh, but I think it's one of those, you, you can't get something for nothing, so there is some time, but hopefully the time is less. And I, one of the main points there is, Viz isn't all about, it's, it's like the, the New York City weather data. You could answer, you know, the Viz is gonna show a lot of things and you could get all that by looking just at that data, but it kind of the, the whole essence of it, if it's like the, the summation over all queries of kind of time taken, the overall thing is less than this other, you know, kind of angle there. And I've had, discussions with Daniel Kimes sometimes about like, well, what if Viz doesn't ever really show you anything new or give you any insights, but it, it simply lets you do it faster. Is that good enough? And he's like, oh, no, no, John, it does more. You know, it'll do insights and stuff. I said, yeah, I think it will. But, but I, I'd almost argue even if it is just saving the time, that's a win. That's good. Yeah. Okay, it's 12.40. Um, so we're going to continue our question and answer session in Cafe West. Let's thank our great speaker again. <laughs> <laughs>